Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the exciting new features in NRF Connect SDK version 2.6.0 that we just released last week. So I am your host for today. My name is Tiago Mont, and I'm a developer marketing manager here at Nordic Semiconductor. So the agenda for today, we'll start with some more uh, generic updates on the SDK. Then we'll move on to development tools and we'll have a demo there of the new features in the uh, device tree visual editor. Then we'll continue with updates on Bluetooth, Matter and Thread. Then moving to Wi-Fi, also including a demo there, cellular IoT NRF, NRF Cloud, Amazon Sidewalk, and we'll wrap that up with PMIP updates also with a demo before we move into the uh, Q&A. So, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing these webinars and many other, you know, sort of developer oriented activities is that one of Nordic's pillars is that we want to excite and support developers. We want to make sure that developers have everything they need uh, to, you know, pick up our solutions, our hardware and our software and work on their code and other project as quickly as possible. So, you know, we host uh, various webinars and these are mostly oriented as technology introductions and some hands on training. Then we have uh, DevZone, that's where our tech support team sort of hangs out, uh, as well as other customers. So you can get direct support if you have issues that you're not being able to work around by yourself. Then we have our recently uh, launched documentation platform, TechDocs. So this is a single source for all of technical documentation from Nordic and also the Dev Academy. So this is our interactive online learning platform. And we have also a few updates on the Dev Academy that you'll see in today's webinar. So let's get started with some generic updates on this new SDK release. Um, actually, before we go through these, I just want to point out that you'll hear basically uh, two terms throughout the presentation when it comes to classifying the maturity of our software. Uh, you'll hear the term supported and experimental. So experimental means, you know, I think quite self-explanatory, but it means that uh, the feature, you know, or, or piece of software that, that is classified as experimental uh, has has had limited test coverage, so it's not fully mature, and also that you know there might be changes in the in the API or that the functionality has not been fully implemented, and then you have the supported uh, maturity statement, which means that you know it, it's fully tested, it's been finalized, the APIs uh, will not change, and that you will have um, you can use it in a production environment. So those are the two things that you'll hear throughout the webinar. So uh, back to generic updates. So we've introduced a new trusted storage library. Uh, the maturity is supported. And that uh, the, the difference here is that, whereas in the past you would have to, you know, you would need to have a TFM platform root of trust uh, to have that implementation of a PSA certified secure storage API. Now uh, that um, implementation is using the hardware unique key. So you'll be able to use the secure, uh, the PSA certified secure storage API, but link it against the device that doesn't have um, TFM capability, meaning that uh, it's a device without trust zone, like the NRF 52840. So the benefit here is that you can use the PSA secure storage APIs on devices without trust zone, or uh, you can also use them on devices with trust zone, but where using TFM may not be desired. Uh, an example could be, you know, if your application code has grown. Uh, to the point where using TFM uh, means that you cannot fit it into the flash anymore. So you may not, you know, be wanting to use that, uh, but of course, in a way that you'll keep your device uh, secure. So that's update, uh, the first update here. And then the second update is that we have, um, we have added experimental, um, uh, link time optimization as experimental. And the goal here is to improve flash usage, essentially for any piece of firmware that you try to build. So we've been, Having some limited testing here, uh, we have some figures here for uh, building the matter over Wi-Fi template sample from the SDK. And the results here are actually quite encouraging. Uh, so on the debug build, this has reduced the flash by 73 kilobytes. So it went from 931 kilobytes down to 858 kilobytes. On the release build, reduced the flash by 64 kilobytes from 840 kilobytes down to 776 kilobytes. So, you know, about you know, between five and 10% uh, savings um, on this sample. Um, yeah, so this is now introduced as, as experimental. So you can use it, but make sure that you know it's experimental status. 
And then another update, not so much related with the SDK uh, itself, but uh, last week we have, all, we have also uh, launched a new NRF Connect uh, SDK Intermediate course in our Dev Academy. So we had already the NRF Connect SDK Fundamentals course, so it builds on that, as well as the fundamentals courses for some of the wireless technologies like Bluetooth LE, Wi-Fi, and Cellular IoT. So this course now will dives a little bit deeper um, into the NRF Connect SDK. So some of the, let's say, um, you know, topics that are common to all the wireless technologies, building on previous courses and adding topics like, you know, how to add custom board support, diving deeper into peripherals like SPI, ADC, PWM. Uh, I think a very interesting topic uh, because, you know, you guys as developers, you probably have a need to develop your own device driver. So how to do that in a way that's compatible uh, with, a, you know, sort of the Zephyr infrastructure so you can use those as Zephyr modules. So device driver development is also a topic. Another really interesting topic is the FU. So how to do security FU uh, device firmware updates, and then you know have those uh, go to the device over a few different transports like UART, USB, uh, external memory, Bluetooth LE, Wi-Fi, or seller, and also some more advanced debug and troubleshooting uh, to make sure you you can um, see what's wrong with your firmware and uh, reach uh, sort of you know improve um, and solve those issues as quickly as possible. Moving on to development tools updates. So in uh, in our Connect for Desktop, we have introduced a new application called the Board Configurator. So if you have your NRF Connect for Desktop installation, you might see this new application pop somewhere on the list. Um, it might not be something that you can use today, and I'll explain why. Uh, but the purpose of this application is that you can actually configure our development kits entirely by software. So that means that you don't need to, you know, change any jumpers or toggle any switches to get different functionality. And, you know, we can also sort of allows us to expand the functionality uh, on, on new kits. For example, you know, configuring the, um, the voltage supply to the, to the target. Um, and the reason why I said you, it's not something you might not be able to use at the moment is that it's started supporting some of the newer kits that we have. So the NRF 9161, development kit, uh, which was launched a few months ago, and also the uh, kit for the recently announced NRF 9151, which is not yet you know, um, available. And then future DKs will also leverage this tool so that you get that possibility to configure everything by software. Uh, but this is uh, what it looks like. So you know, if you were configured, um, if, if you were connected to a kit that supports the tool, then you would have the ability, for example, to enable the VCOMs from, from here, um, you know, coexistence, change the, the voltage, and many other uh, configurations, of course, depending a bit on what the kit offers as well. And moving on to uh, NRF Connect for VS Code, we have updates on the device tree visual editor. So up until now, this feature has been uh, labeled as experimental maturity, and we're happy to communicate that this is now a supported feature. And it also brings some uh, improvements and and you know improved usability. So there's a new peripherals view, uh, essentially what you see here on this screenshot. So it sort of uh, delineates the SOC and and you know shows you all the peripherals that you have uh, available to be used. Uh, it also has its own entry on VS Code Sidebar. So if you, you will see now a new icon just underneath the NRF Connect for VS Code extension icon, there will be a dedicated icon for this, so you can more easily access that. You will also have uh, in editor diagnostics. What that means is that if you see these little warning signs or sometimes error signs, uh, these will indicate that there are issues in your configuration that you should look at to make sure that it's robust. There's a new add device workflow, which we'll show in the demo uh, just after this slide. You can also see the drag and drop pin assignments. We'll also show that on the demo. Uh, but a couple of important remarks here is that, you know, just like when we introduced the device to visual editor the first time, uh, there is absolutely no disruption to existing projects. So this tool is just a representation of the device tree uh, file, the text file, uh, which means you can use it on existing projects, you can use it for new projects. Uh, and also um, another thing is that if you don't want to use this version um, because you get the updates automatically in VS Code, but if for some reason you don't want to jump into this version yet, if you go to the uh, extensions and then there's the cog wheel on the NRF Connect uh, device tree extension, you can install the older version and stick with that a little bit longer. Um, so you can sort of, you know, go to this version, try it out a little bit, but if you're more comfortable with older version, you can also 
uh, install that and and continue developing with that until you want to uh, make the um, make the move to the most updated version. And with that, let's take a look at the demo and show you guys how this actually works in practice. Okay, so let's go through the uh, new device tree visual editor with a demo. So what I have here is the uh, peripheral light button surface sample. I've already copied that, but if you were to copy the app, you would go to create new application, copy a sample. And if you just type LPS, you'll find that listed here on the dropdown. Then you can have these, you have these hand, um, very handy icons here to uh, jump to the documentation or the uh, GitHub repository. But that has been already uh, created. Uh, I've made two small modifications to the source code. So I just have a print statement when the LED state changes and the same thing for the button. So when you press the button and the notification gets sent to the mobile app or when the mobile app changes the state of the LED, we'll see those coming up in the terminal. So I already have a uh, build configuration for the NRF52840 DK. That's the kit that I have to run the app. So for this time, what I'm going to do is to create a new custom board and then build with that custom board definition and then flash that onto the kit. So we can see that the behavior in the firmware will, will be exactly the same as if uh, using the kit configuration. So to do that, we'll go here to create new board. And then it has this new flow ask for a name for our board. So I'll just call it something very simple. My board, uh, use the same for the machine readable, and then I'll select my part. So it's the NRF52840, uh, and the specific one is this one, the one at the top. And yeah, so the root directory will be the um, folder where I have the where I have the project. Name of the company, yeah, I don't have a company, uh, or I can write Nordic, but I'll just write my company, and we'll go with that. Okay, so, um, now that we have the custom board, we need to create the uh, build configuration so that we can actually go and edit the board. So I'll go here to close this. I'll go to the NRF Connect extension and then add build configuration. And what we can see here is that there will be the option to choose custom. So we have now custom board. So if I click there, immediately it will find the board that I just created. And I will not build because I need to actually modify the board before I can build. So I'll just go and to generate uh, configuration. Uh, this will take a few seconds. And what we'll see is that once we have that build configuration in there, we will have the board device tree available uh, here for us to go and edit. And then we can use uh, the device tree visual editor to make those changes. So we're going to add um, essentially everything that's needed to run the sample. In this case, the LEDs, the buttons, uh, and the UARTs are needed. Okay, so we have the build configuration. So if I just go and um, it's actually already pre-selected. So, whoops, I didn't want to add a new one. Um, so if you now expand here the device tree, we see that there's a my board DTS file in there. So of course this is a text, it's a text file, right? And the device tree visual editor will simply offer a visual representation of this. So there's no sort of intermediate data format or anything, it's just, a yeah, representation of the text file and the changes can be made on either the tool or on the text-based version. So with this file open, um, I can and go and click on this uh, little you know, chip uh, icon on the top right and I get the visual editor. And that will immediately jump into the extension here, um, which is now on the, on the sidebar. So this shows all of the nodes uh, and also you get the, here are the properties, and then this is the the new addition is that now you have a view of the peripherals in, in the SOC. So uh, let's expand on this and let's actually go and start adding things. So the first thing I need to do is to enable uh, GPIO zero, because this is where the LEDs, buttons, and UART are connected, and also this peripheral uh, for the event, the event management between the GPIOs. And then we'll go to add a node. So the flow is so that there's this gigantic plus sign you can see here on the top right. So we'll just go and click add node in there. So we'll start with the LEDs. So yes, IO pins, there's a variety of things you could add in here. So we'll go with the IO pins and yes, I want an LED. So we know these are called you know LED zero uh, to three. So start with LED zero, select the pin. So LED zero is connected to P 
uh, 013. And if we go to our um, UI, now we can see that we have LED 0 connected to P013. So let's continue adding more LEDs. Uh, LED uh, 1, and this is connected to, well, now it's sequential. So P013 plus P014. Uh, I'll do this with the keyboard, it's a bit faster. LED 2 is connected to 15. And then LED 3 is connected to P016. Actually, no, this is not correct. It's connected to, so I need to go through properties. It's actually connected to P026. So this one is not fully sequential. There we go. We just changed it quite quickly in the properties view. Now we're going to add the button. So again, IO pins uh, button, and we have uh, button zero. So that one is connected to P011. Then we'll add uh, button one, which is connected to P012. Button, oops, button, um, uh, button two now is connected to P024. So we need to jump a little bit forward. And finally, uh, finally, button three is connected to P025. So we have now added our LEDs and buttons. Uh, however, we need to change the configuration. So the LEDs are actually active low, uh, and we can change that very easily in this. Um, yeah, there's kind of a shortcut here on the LED parameter. So we can just click on that, and it will toggle to active low. So we'll do that on all four LEDs. And then on the buttons, kind of a similar thing. So we need to set a pull up. Right now, there's no pull set, whether pull up or pull down. So we need to set and it defaults straight away to pull up. If we were to click again, it would go to pull down and then back to one set. So we want pull up on all the LEDs, uh, sorry, all the buttons. And we also want, the, want these to be active low. So we just repeat that exercise across all the buttons, set the pulls and active low. So there we go. Um, now we need to add our UART. So we'll go here to the uh, list of peripherals underneath the uh, SOC node, and we will look for uh, UART, which is here, UART 0. And if we zoom out, uh, where is the UART? Oops, actually, I didn't, seems that I didn't select it. Okay, there we go. I thought I had, but I actually didn't check the box. So now we need to define our pins for TX, RX, TS, and uh, RTS, and also the baud rate. So let's start with the pins. We can actually see them straight away uh, on the left-hand side in the properties. So for TX, it's uh, P06. For RX, it's P08. And then for RTS, it's P05. And CTS, P07. And then we set the baud rate. You know, it's 115, uh, 200. All right, um, and last thing we need to do here on the uh, device tree is to add alias. Uh, so we'll go here to uh, the chosen and we need to add a property. And that property is uh, Zephyr console. So we need to direct the Zephyr console to the UART. So we select the node and we'll just type UART, UART zero, and we'll click add. So essentially all the changes are, are now done on the device tree. Uh, the one thing I just want to show before wrapping this piece is that if we go to the pins, one new feature is that you can, uh, if you want to change a pin assignment, you can very easily drag and drop. So if I would just do change this LED from P015 to another one, I could just drag uh, and drop into somewhere else. So I won't do that. So I don't change the configuration, but this is now you know a very easy way uh, to change things in your, pin assignment by just drag and dropping on the uh, pins view, not the peripherals view. Okay, so uh, my device tree configuration is done. So I have now my custom board defined. Uh, there's only a couple of things I still need to do on the configuration uh, file for my project. So I need to go into the, actually uh, in the in here and config files, kconfig, project config, and what I'm going to do is add uh, the configurations that bring, you know, things like serial, console, and so on. So I'll just go copy these and add them in here. So now we're actually ready to build. So let's go and build um, our project for this board. So we'll proceed build. 
And then what we're going to do is uh, just flush that onto the uh, to the kit. Uh, but it's now the firmware has been built not with the uh, kit board definition, but with the custom board definition that we have created uh, from scratch. And then we can um, check on the terminal that we can act on the LEDs, we can act on the buttons, and uh, we'll see that through interaction with the mobile app. So let's just uh, wait for this to build. Shouldn't take shouldn't take too long. And we already have the uh, COM port connection open to the kit, so we can very quickly uh, connect to the kit and, and see that in action. OK, now our build is complete. So let's go and flash that to our kit. And let's now move into the. Um, terminal so we can see the messages coming in. These messages are from the last time that I ran the firmware on the um, on the kit. Flushing is done, verifying programming, resetting, and we should, OK. So now we have our firmware running. You see that we start advertising. And let's bring in the mobile app. So I have an Android device here with me. And it's scanning for devices, uh, for Bluetooth devices, so it finds our kit that's advertising with Nordic LBS. So we connect to that. And now we have the option to toggle the LEDs, and we also get the button state notification. So if I go and toggle, we'll see that the uh, the messages are coming on the terminal. So let's state on and off. So let's back to the app. On, off, on, off. And if I press button three on the kit, we can see that you know the state changes here on the app, and we see the messages on the terminal as well. OK, so with this short demonstration, we just aim to show that you know the device through your visual editor is a really uh, indispensable tool to get you started to you know, modify your hardware definition. And it's something that uh, we really hope that you're excited to use. And if you have any feedback, feel free to head out to DevZone and let us know what you think and what kind of you know, things we would like to see there. Thanks. Now moving on to updates on uh, Bluetooth. So the first thing, and this is actually a really important update, at least when it comes to LE audio, is that the um, uh, we introduced LE asynchronous channels as experimental on the NRF Connect SDK 2.5.0. And now this has uh, moved from experimental to supported feature. So the uh, Nordic, you know, the soft device controller uh, can now support LE audio. So that's a major update. And the, the, the next slide will also uh, build up on it a little bit. Uh, we support both, you know, connected isochronous as well as broadcast isochronous. Um, and I mean, this is oriented towards LE audio, but it's also a general feature uh, that can be used in, in a few use cases. For example, if you need low latency or if you need to have, you know, synchronization of receivers. Um, yeah, offering you know performance and flexibility, and you can get some more information on the documentation for some of the configurations that we we tested uh, with Sys and Biz. And then on LE Audio, uh, you know, based on now this um, supported maturity for the Zarkonos channels on the uh, soft device controller, so we had the um, uh, NR fifty three forty audio application in the SDK. And it has gone through a few updates. So the, the main update is that now the, there used to be dedicated LE audio controller subsystem. And now that has been changed to use our own soft device controller. And that has an, you know, it was enabled by having this asynchronous channels feature uh, moving from experimental to supported. Uh, the application has also been refactored, uh, expanded, and improved. And we you know, split what used to be a very large application into a few smaller uh, use case oriented applications. So when you go into documentation, you'll see that now there's a few different smaller applications. And depending on the sort of, you know, all the other use cases you're trying to put together, uh, you'll be able to sort of mix and match those smaller applications to get the configuration that you need. Um, although the um, Zuckerman's Channels feature uh, is uh, supported maturity, uh, this application as such is experimental maturity. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And the last update within Bluetooth is for Bluetooth Mesh, uh, is in the Bluetooth Mesh domain. So the first thing is that we have added support for the NRF52840 dongle on a few samples. That's the guy you see here on the right-hand side. 
Uh, we've also done some improvements on uh, mesh DFU process uh, with a script for extracting some of the metadata automatically. So when you build the application, you run the script and then it will get to the metadata that is needed to, to do the DFU. And there's also a new um, sensor API uh, with a support of maturity. And that uh, is now making it possible to um, have an accurate representation of all the encodable uh, sensor values, which was not the case with the, with the previous sensor API. So moving into um, Matter and uh, Thread updates. So starting with Matter, and the biggest um, piece of news here is that we have Matter 1.2 support in the 2.6.0 NRF Connect SDK. Uh, I'll leave you here with a link to a uh, connectivity standards line. So the CSA um, means connectivity standards line, so blog post where they go into a bit more detail on what Matter 1.2 brings. But as a summary, it brings nine new device types. So these include refrigerators, uh, room air conditioners, dishwashers, laundry washers, water vacuums, smoke, uh, carbon monoxide alarms, air quality sensors, air purifiers, and fans. And then it brings uh, many other you know, sort of improvements to the uh, core specification. Uh, we also have some improvements on uh, security on the matter over thread um, implementation that is now using the PSA certified secure storage API uh, so that the storage of keys and certificates is done in a more uh, secure way. And we have some uh, improvements in flash usage. So if you, um, if you saw the release highlights for NRF Connect SDK 2.5.0, we had done a RAM usage reduction on, on matter. And now we're doing flash usage reduction. Um, and that we have some figures here from the matter over thread template sample uh, for two different targets. So if you're building for the NR52840, uh, we have a reduction of 48 kilobytes for debug build and 50 kilobytes for release build. Uh, building for the NR5340, there's a reduction of 36 kilobytes for debug build and 39 kilobytes for release build. Um, on thread still just not you know uh, strictly related with the SDK but we we have written and published a white paper called matter over thread power consumption and battery life uh, so this you know provides an overview of the uh, power consumption in matter over thread and sort of describes the tries to go into some detail over the parameters that can be configured so that you know that affect the device behavior and the power consumption uh, and it has quite a lot of sort of interesting data and observations you know like dependency you know, the dependency between things like sleepy intervals, the ecosystem, you know, sleepy end device usage and, and so on. So I encourage you guys to uh, look into this if you're uh, building matter over thread devices, uh, which are battery powered. And uh, still on matter. So we introduced an application on the um, NRF Connect SDK 2.5.0 called the Matter Bridge application. And that was uh, experimental maturity at the time. Now that is supported maturity and the, um, this release of the NRF Connect SDK. So just trying to summarize what, what this allows you to do is to uh, bridge between um, non-matter devices, like for example, Bluetooth LE uh, are uh, devices that don't run matter. So matter runs on top of thread or Wi-Fi as a transport. It does include Bluetooth LE, but it's only for commissioning. It's not used as the transport once the device is in actual operation. But this matter bridge application allows you to bridge uh, Bluetooth LE uh, devices as well as any other non-matter enable devices like for example, Zigbee. And then you can bridge those into a matter fabric. So in it, essentially you can um, you know, control and access those non-matter devices as if they were matter devices uh, through the bridge application. Um, so this bridge application today only supports Bluetooth LE devices uh, and you can have you know, 19 devices concurrently. So 19 devices connected at the same time but you can expand, expand that to dozens of devices you know, intermittently by connecting and disconnecting as, as needed. Uh, but of course, it, it can be used as a reference, meaning that you know, today we support Bluetooth LE, but you can use it as a reference and expand on the functionality uh, so that you can create the matter bridge to essentially any non-matter enabled protocol, whether it's Zigbee or something else. Uh, this application runs on the NRF uh, 7002 DK and if you're interested, I really encourage you guys to look at the, the demo that we did on the NRF Connect SDK 2.5.0 webinar when we first introduced this application. 
And now for thread, um, we have added um, experimental support for thread commissioning over authenticated TLS. So it's TCAT for short. Essentially, it's trying to address some needs in the professional and commercial installation markets. Um, because typically, you know, one way to install these um, devices would be by scanning QR codes. But that's, of course, a bit of a tedious process. You need to go and scan codes on devices one by one. So this would allow now commissioning to be done uh, wirelessly by exchanging security certificates through a authenticated Bluetooth LE connection. So there would be you know, certificates signed by the CA on both the device and on the commissioner, and then they would be able to uh, authenticate each other uh, wirelessly. So you could have a device that goes around and sort of commissions you know, post-installation all of these you know, commercial or professional devices um, out, out in an installation. Okay, so now for updates on uh, Wi-Fi. Um, okay, so the first feature, there's quite a bit of content on Wi-Fi on this release. Uh, the first feature is raw Wi-Fi transmission mode. So this is a supported feature. What it allows you to do is to transmit on-air uh, packets that are conformant with uh, the IEEE 802.11 standard. So you have two modes of operation here, uh, connected mode. So you can transmit packets which are not destined for the you know, access point network they're, they're, that you are connected to, where you would be you know, communicating using the regular uh, networking APIs, or non-connected mode. So here you can transmit raw packets, just any kind of raw packets. Like for example, if you want to emulate um, a device that's just beaconing for you know, location or, or tracking purposes. So those, the way this works, um, you know, in the sort of the software stack level. Um, so if you have your application running on a host device, let's say the NRF uh, 5340, so you would your application would fabricate this uh, 802.11 packet and generate the the raw TX header using the Zephyr raw socket API. So that would go down to the uh, the driver, um, the NRF 70 Wi-Fi driver running on the host. That would then remove the TX header and use that information to configure the TX and the five parameters uh, for the component IC. And then the communication between the host and the NRF70 series device is done over SPI or QSPI. And then on the Wi-Fi device uh, that would validate the packet, add the, the CRC, and then just you know, finally transmit that uh, over the air. Uh, there's a sample available uh, to demonstrate this, this feature, a Wi-Fi raw TX packet. And, and what it's actually showing in terms of functionality is this uh, scenario, this soft beaconing. So you're building, you know, creating the beaconing uh, back packet content, let's say, in the application, and then sending that off using using this feature. And that is supported on the NRF 7002 and the NRF 7001 devices. So not the NRF 7000, which is a scanning only device. So next feature is the uh, raw Wi-Fi reception monitor mode. So there's actually two reception types uh, that we're going to discuss. The first one is the monitor mode. Uh, this is an experimental feature. So this is, this is essentially a bit like the opposite of raw TX um, feature. So now what we're doing is that we're listening to all of the compliant traffic on any given channel. And this one, uh, the monitor mode is not limited to a specific access point network or a B BSS ID. Um, yeah, you can configure and enable this at runtime, and a few things to to be aware of. So the having monitor mode concurrently with with a connection, so we're, you know operating as a station connected to an access point is not supported. Um, however, uh, concurrent monitor mode and the feature we just discussed before the raw TX mode that is supported. So yeah, the way this works is basically now the flow is the opposite uh, from the raw TX uh, mode, right? So we have the NRF70 series devices that it's capturing all of those frames over the air on the specific channel. So that's the key thing that it's on a select channel and any BSS ID. Uh, then the host driver will validate the packet, filter out traffic that uh, was undesired because it is configurable append radio parameter header and deliver that to application layer. And then the application, uh, the API will then strip that out and present the data um, to, the, to the application. So essentially you get things like data rate, RSSI, you know, receive frequency, frame type, the data, and, and so on. Uh, it also supports filtering for customized operation, uh, means that you can, you know, you, you can use the API to filter for, for example, frame types or certain sizes. Uh, and there is also a sample available on, on the SDK, the Wi-Fi monitor sample. And when it comes to um, 
you know support with the different variants is the same as the RTX uh, RTX feature. It's support on the NRF 7002 and the NRF 7001. And quite similar to the monitor mode is also the promiscuous mode. So this is almost the same as the monitor mode. The biggest difference is that instead of listening to any BSS ID on a given channel, we're actually listening to all the traffic on the connected BSS ID. So if you look at this diagram on the right hand side, everything is the same as in the previous uh, monitor mode, except what we're listening to. So now we're listening to uh, 802 traffic, 802.11 traffic on the connected network. So now we're listening to traffic um, from the access point that we're connected to, including traffic that might be destined to other stations, which is not you know, the, the one that, that uh, where the firmware is running. Uh, otherwise, uh, the same, um, essentially everything applies uh, as, as in the monitor mode. So you have configurable and enabled at runtime. Um, oh, in this case, of course, because you need to be actually connected to an access point, you do have concurrent promiscuous and station supported, but you don't have concurrent promiscuous and raw TX. So that is also another difference comparing promiscuous with, with monitor mode. Uh, the same support for filtering and uh, customized operation as in the monitor mode. Uh, for this one, we don't have a dedicated sample, but you can use the Wi-Fi shell uh, sample um, and then you'll have the commands which allow you to, to um, evaluate uh, this new mode. And the same information when it comes to the uh, supported NRF 70 IC variants, the uh, 7002 and the 7001. Another feature uh, at this point, uh, experimental, is um, software-enabled access point, or you know sometimes uh, just soft AP in, in the short version. Um, so this means that the NRF70 device can operate as, a, as an access point, a software-based access point. The most common use case uh, for soft AP is provisioning. So what this means is that you connect to the device. Um, so the device starts off as, a, as an access point with no credentials. And then you'll have something like a mobile phone that will connect to this soft access point, and then it will pass the credentials of the actual access point that you want to connect to. So normally this means that you would have an HTTP server, for example, that would, um, you know, when the um, when the station connected to the um, soft AP, uh, they would see, for example, a, a web page uh, with you know text boxes or or placeholders where they can put the credentials for the soft AP. And then when you say there'll be some confirmation, like an OK button or something like that, and once when it's once the once you you know the user uh, selects that option, then what would happen is that the NRF70 uh, device would then uh, move from soft AP and it would then uh, you know change to station mode, and then it would use those credentials to connect to your uh, access point of choice using the credentials that were passed. So um, the benefit here is that you know the provisioning method that we have on the SDK today, or one of them at least, is the sample using the Bluetooth, uh, you know, Bluetooth LE connection. You can also do NFC-based provisioning. But now, if we have the soft AP method, then of course you don't need to have the Bluetooth LE stack there anymore, or or any sort of additional firmware, let's say, uh, to handle that. So it lowers the uh, the resource requirements, especially when it comes to RAM and flash. And of course, if you have then uh, a wireless IoT device that's Wi-Fi only, so you don't have Bluetooth LE, or you don't want to have Bluetooth LE, then this provisioning method using SoftTP is very suitable for those use cases. Uh, there's a sample um, in the SDK, Wi-Fi SoftTP. It runs a DHCP server, so when you connect with a station, you'll get an IP address assigned. Um, it does not yet support sort of this full provisioning mechanism, so that's coming a little bit later. Um, and the same thing when it comes to supported NRF70 IC variants, the NRF7002 and the NRF7001. And some uh, additional updates. Um, so there's one new feature concerning uh, firmware patches. So before this, um, before this SDK version, uh, if you, the NRF70 series, there's you can have firmware patches that are loaded to the uh, companion IC at boot from the host side. And those would have to reside in the internal flash. Now you have the option that those patches can reside on an external NPM. So that could be a, an external NAND flash, for example, instead of the onboard flash. And of course, the benefit here is that it will release that space from the internal flash for your application. So we're talking about we're talking about up to uh, 70 kilobytes of space uh, that will be um, released for the application running on the host device. For example, if you have a uh, NRF. Uh, 5340 or NRF52840 as a host to the NRF70. 
Uh, some updates on security. Um, there is a, a number of uh, Zephyr networking samples that uh, support the NRS 7002DK. Now they can be built with uh, with the FM. So that will provide isolation between the secure and non-secure processing environments to enhance the security of your firmware. We have some new networking samples, uh, Coop Client and HTTP server. Um, so actually the Coop Client was already in place, but it only supported uh, cellular. So now it also supports a Wi-Fi target and the HTTP server is a new sample. Both of them now support either a cellular IoT or a Wi-Fi target. So you can build for a NRF 7002 DK, or you can build for a you know, NRF 9161 DK for cellular IoT. And then we also have a new Wi-Fi throughput sample. Um, and this allows you to very easily measure, you know, sort of the throughput that you get at the IP level. So with the UDP or TCP transport. And we prepared a demo to show you how this sample works. So let's move on to that one. Okay, so let's quickly see how this Wi-Fi, uh, this new Wi-Fi throughput sample uh, works. You can find the documentation uh, very easily. Um, if you're at the top level of the documentation, you go to samples and then you find your protocol of choice. So in this, in this case, we have to scroll to Wi-Fi down here. And then once you're there, then you can uh, yeah, list the samples. So if I would click there, you would get the list of samples and you'll find Wi-Fi throughput in here. So uh, going briefly through the documentation. Uh, so what this sample gives you is the ability to sort of, you know, construct a test setup for Wi-Fi th uh, throughput measurement. So you'll have your, your access point, whether it's your home access point or, or office access point. Then you'll have a Wi-Fi peer device. So normally that was, this would be a laptop or a PC. That's going to run the iPerf utility. And then you have the NRF 7002DK with the throughput sample flashed. And that will run the Zperf utility, which is sort of the Zephyr equivalent of the iPerf. Um, to build the application, I have a few profiles that you can choose from. We uh, have built and flashed already to the kit with a high performance. So that brings sort of an uh, overlay configuration uh, with a few K configs that you know, maximize the performance of the firmware. And then essentially what we'll be doing here is that we're going to, um, you know, I've already connected with my access point. We have the instructions here uh, using the shell commands, how to connect, scan, connect, and then check the status of the access point. But we'll try to keep this demo short. So essentially you will have, uh, you have the possibility of doing upload and download tests. Uh, we're just gonna do the upload uh, to make it a bit faster. So from the uh, peer device, meaning the PC, we're going to run the iperf command and we can do UDP and then TCP test. And then on the, um, on the terminal side uh, that is talking to the target, so the NRF 7002DK, we're going to run the zperf command. So you have here the sort of the command composition. You can also get this from the command line help. And I'll go here to my uh, VS Code extension. And so what I have here is on the on the lower side, I have the terminal connected to COM13, which is connected to my uh, NRF 7002DK. And on the on the upper side, I have just the PowerShell uh, where I'll call the iperf commands. So in my installation, this is iperf2. Uh, so that's the name of the command. Okay, so um, let's go and uh, have the commands here ready to go. So, so what we're going to do is the upload test. So sending data from the kit to the PC. So I can go and start the UDP server here on the PC side. And then on the, on the target side, what we're doing is this uh, command zperf and then UDP or TCP. We're going to start with the UDP test, upload, and then the IP um, IP address of, of the peer device, meaning the, the PC, uh, the port, so 5001, as you can see here, UDP port 5001, and then the duration. So we're going to run this for 10 seconds with a packet size of one kilobyte with a data rate of 50 uh, megabits per second. So I'll just go and press enter there. And we can see here on the upper side, the iPerf gives us sort of a second by second report of the bandwidth. So we're seeing quite uh, quite good figures over here. And once the 10 seconds have finalized, we have sort of the, the average uh, on, on the zperf as a, as a summary. Okay, um, let's now you know do the same thing for TCP where you know, obviously we should be expecting a lower uh, throughput because you know there's overhead at the IP layer with the acknowledgements. So let me start the um, stop the iperf and restart that without the U option at the end, which stands for UDP. And then we'll basically, you know, issue the same command. The only difference is that instead of zperf UDP, we have zperf TCP um, to stand. You know, so we, we we change the protocol. So I'll start the um, 
server side first on the PowerShell, and then we can start the uh, upload. Yeah, so as expected, the bandwidth is going to be uh, a little bit uh, lower than using UDP, uh, but that's the, just the nature of those protocols. All right, and that's that's pretty much it. So you can uh, test also download. You have those commands further down, uh, how you do. So basically you revert, right? You start zperf on the target side and then you do iperf um, from the um, uh, from the PC side. And you would basically see uh, you know uh, similar results. So that's it. So this sample is quite useful, uh, but of course, keep in mind that Wi-Fi throughput can vary from setup to setup. Uh, you know, by changing the environment, different access point, you know, different station devices. But still, if you have a scenario that you want to at least, uh, or you're curious how the throughput looks like, uh, this um, this sample gives you the tools to try that in a very, very easy, very uh, user friendly way. Okay, let's continue now then with the webinar. All right, I hope you uh, enjoyed the. The demo we prepared for you and uh, before we wrap up on wi-fi i just wanted to highlight in in case um in case you've missed it we have uh, we've introduced a wi-fi fundamentals course it's not exactly you know news as such this was introduced uh i think in uh, late november of last year but it was after the last sdk webinar we had on the 2.5.0 release so it wasn't um it wasn't included there uh but now just want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware that we also have this course available um, so yeah, it, it goes through the theory of Wi-Fi technology, uh, goes through some of the most relevant features of Wi-Fi 6, especially when it comes to, you know, those that are applicable to low power, which is, you know, what Nordic is all about, low power. So those are the most important features that, that we focus on. It also has, you know, hands-on coding, uh, exercises, uh, you would need to have a 7002 DK to run those. And it goes through a number of topics, you know, Wi-Fi provisioning, also how to measure throughput as, as a dedicated uh, hands-on exercise on that, uh, connections with HTTPS, MQTT, and TLS. And of course, then uh, very important for IoT devices, especially battery-operated IoT devices, you know, enabling and uh, configuring uh, power safe modes. And as with all of our Dev Academy courses, you you get a certificate at the end of the course, and you can share that on, on LinkedIn and add that to your, uh, to your profile. All right, so that's it for Wi-Fi. Let's move on to the next topic. On seller IoT updates, um, not so much content this time. So first thing is that we added support for the NRF9151 DK. So this was a recently announced part. It's not yet widely available, but it's already supported in the, the SDK on a majority of the seller IoT samples. Um, the serial LT modem application. Um, so this has also been updated uh, in a way that it can be used so that you sort of turn a NRF91 series SIP into a standalone modem, which was already the case before. But the, the news here is that now this will be supported by Zephyr Seller modem driver. So it makes it you know a bit more um, easier to, to sort of make it as a modular component in a system. And then a few experimental features on the um, on the cloud side on some of the sort of cloud oriented samples. So the NRF cloud multi service sample runtime installation TLS certificates using a new TLS credentials shell uh, when you're building for a Wi-Fi connectivity target. So this, although it's a seller uh, sample, it it also supports uh, building for for a Wi-Fi uh, target. And then also communicating uh, with the NRF cloud uh, through either MQTT or CoAP. And then on the um, NRF cloud services auto onboarding that was added um, as experimental to you know the the same sample we just talked about the NRF cloud multi service as well as the NRF cloud REST device message sample. So both those samples have now um, have experimental support for NRF cloud security services auto onboarding feature. Amazon Sidewalk. Um, so for Amazon Sidewalk, we have now integrated a new version of the Amazon Sidewalk MCU SDK. So this is the sort of the piece of code that MC, that Amazon provides uh, to everyone who is offering Sidewalk. A few new features here, uh, multi-link, uh, autonomous link switching as supported. So this allows applications to sort of configure um, rules and policies that can optimize radio link usage. So, you know, if you have data to send, it was based on this policy uh, that that is defined by the uh, by the user. Then, 
you know, the data would go over the various transport options available for sidewalk, Bluetooth LE, LoRa, or, or um, FSK. Uh, there's a link to an Amazon sidewalk application on that offers uh, some more details there. Then also um, on-device key generation as supported. So this is meant to enhance uh, security at uh, manufacturing time. And also Amazon offers quite comprehensive documentation on that, um, on that topic. We added support also for Thingy53 as a development platform. So before you only had some of the VKs, now you can also use Thing, uh, Thingy53 to develop sidewalk applications. And uh, one new feature uh, that was added experiment as experimental was the downlink file transfer over Bluetooth LE. So essentially, this allows you to send files of up to one megabyte to you know sort of your entire fleet of IoT devices from the AWS IoT Fuota. Uh, Fuota here stands for firmware updates over the air, um, and that is a task that's available on the AWS IoT uh, framework. Um, the current implementation, you know, the reason why it's experimental is that you know the implementation that we have today covers basic scenario, and we actually don't have the DFU piece integrated yet. And for updates on PMIC as the last topic of today's webinar, um, some uh, updates on on configurations uh, that you can do from the from the host side. So LDO, so load dropout and load switches. Uh, the soft, soft start uh, configuration to limit voltage fluctuation. So this is to avoid sort of peaks in voltage. Uh, this is something that, you know, for most use cases is done automatically by the driver. But if you want to sort of fine tune or have control over this, now you have that option. And also the PFM mode configuration um, is, was added for additional flexibility. Again, something that is typically automatically managed, but you know, just offering more flexibility, more options to, to our customers. And then we have a new uh, sample called NPM 1300 one button. Uh, and that demonstrates how you can support a few, a few different scenarios, wake up, shut down, and other user interactions through a single button connected to the NPM 1300 using the NPM 1300 AK. And my colleague Robin has prepared a demo for us. So let's uh, move on to, to that. Yeah, thanks, Tiago. Uh, so here I have a NRF52 development kit, which is flashed with this uh, NPM one button sample. And you can see the, the kit is powered via this red lead uh, by the output of buck two on this uh, NPM 1300 evaluation kit. And then it also has the TWI connections and uh, interrupt pin connection to a GPIO here on the EK uh, that allows it to flash this LED on and off through the integrated LED drivers on the PMIC. And if I push the ship hold button shortly, the LED starts blinking faster and what it also does is that it enables uh, one of the load switches it, that's uh, connected via this jumper to a from a buck uh, on a PMIC to one of these resistors that as, acts like a current sync device, uh, which emulates uh, a load on the PMIC. And this is an, a, a sample to show how you can integrate the GPIO functionality uh, on the PMIC. Um, and the biggest benefit of this uh, I.O. functionality is, of course, you could connect buttons directly to the 52 series SOC and have interrupts work that way. Uh, but one of the features of the PMIC is that it has this hard reset functionality. Uh, so if you long press the ship hold button, you're actually able to complete the, do a full system reboot with a power cycle and everything just by holding one button. And that's something you obviously couldn't implement just with a uh, just with the SOC because a button would become unresponsive in the event of uh, frozen software. Uh, so you see, I held the button down and it reset the whole system and it went back to blinking uh, slowly. You could also make it go back to blinking slowly by doing a slightly longer press, uh, which is in the firmware 4052 uh, in the sample. 
Uh, another neat feature is that it can actually use this same button as a power off button for the whole system. So if we just disconnect the battery for a while and connect a power profiler kit instead, and we open up the power profiler app we can see that the kit are drawing around 7 milliamps on average if we make the LED blink faster and also enable this load switch that connects this current sink to the buck, we can see that the current rises, of course. But then we can try to do an even longer press than the long press that makes it go back to slowly blinking. And we can see that the kits are now in total only using 370 nanoamps uh, for the whole system. So basically they are using less power than the battery discharges itself by. And even though they're in such an ultra low power state, only by clicking this same button once it goes back into being functional device. And this is how many modern uh, embedded devices work they have one button that has both that controls both settings when the device is on and when uh, the device is off it turns the device on and it also uses the same button to perform a hard reset if something goes catastrophically wrong in the system firmware and that is exactly what this uh, sample is supposed to uh, be a reference design for All right, so that was everything for today's webinar. Uh, you know, we, uh, of course, encourage you to uh, continue to engage with Nordic. You can sign up for uh, webinars at webinars.nordicsemi.com. Uh, highly encourage everyone to take some of our courses at the Academy, academy.nordicsemi.com, including the ones that uh, we just discussed today, the new Wi-Fi uh, course. Well, new, maybe not so new. It's been there for a few months, but the, the very, very new NRF Connect SDK Intermediate course. If you need uh, tech support, uh, head out to the uh, DevZone on, um, you know, at devzone.norexam.com. And of course, for more generic information on our products and services, uh, you can always head to nordicsemi.com. And let's move to the Q&A and try to address as many questions as possible uh, from those that came during the webinar. Okay, so um, we only had two questions coming in. Uh, the first one uh, is asking about the Bluetooth Tele audio application when it's expected to move uh, from experimental uh, to support it. Um, yeah, we don't typically answer roadmap questions on these webinars, so I can't really give an answer to this one. And there's another one a little bit more technical. Um, how to create my own compatibility class for my new board? Is there a GUI for that? So. Not exactly sure what compatibility class means. I mean, this is not a concept within Zephyr. Um, maybe my recommendation is that you um, post this question to DevZone, uh, try to articulate uh, with a bit more clarity uh, what the question is. And I'm sure that our tech support team will be able to help you with that. Um, yeah, and with that, I think we can uh, wrap up for today. Thanks everyone who attended and uh, have a rest of a nice day. Thanks for joining. Yeah, right. So we had a few questions coming in. Uh, I'll go through them now. Uh, I think some of them actually got answered during the webinar, uh, but let's go through them anyway. So first question, are all the new Matter 1.2 device types supported in SDK 2.6.0? So yes, we have support for Matter 1.2, you know, including all the features that come with that, with that specification. Uh, but one side note here is that 
you won't be finding samples for every single device type. So of course, you know, you know, putting samples out and, and keeping them updated, that's a you know significant effort. So we need to make some priority calls there and um, you know, have the samples that uh, you know for the devices that are the most the most common ones that we see our customers using. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you'll be left in the dark if you're doing a device that that you don't have a sample for, because for that then we have this template sample that I also discussed during the webinar. So you have the matter um, over thread template and the matter over Wi-Fi template, depending you know which transport you're trying to use. So you can use that as a starting point. Uh, to build, um, you know, a, a matter application for which we don't have a sample that matches the device that you're trying to to develop. All right, another question. Uh, anytime soon to see thingy devices recognized in VS Code? Um, it's like, it's been a while since I've used the thingies, but one change that happened a bit, you know, behind the scenes is that um, so on the demo um, for the device tree visual editor, when I went to the devices list. Uh, so what's what's you know on the, the back end of that is actually nrfutil, and nrfutil does support connecting to things and you know flashing through MCU boot. So it might be there already, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, if you haven't tried it in a while, I suggest that you go and try it. Um, if you're having issues, then you know go and ask on DevZone. I'm not 100% sure, but my guess is that if it's not there, then it could be coming quite soon, because nrfutil is now the the back end in in VS Code to get the um, you know that uh, connection to the um, to the kits um, from um, from the extension. All right, uh, then another question is the new SDK 2.6 fully verified for Ubuntu 22 LTS in VS Code and yes, it is. It has tier one uh, support, so I'll I'll put a link on the chat now where you'll find the um, the requirements. Um, so you'll have the different list of OSs. And and the architectures and you know the support that we have for those combinations. So you can use that as a, as a reference for Ubuntu or, or some other OS that you might be doing. Another question: uh, I noticed that um, in the VS Code device tree visual editor, you seem to have a generic GPIO configuration. Does that use Nordic LED button compatible entry, or is there a generic GPIO compatible entry? Yes, there is a generic uh, GPIO uh, concept in Zephyr, uh, which has its own API. And I will also now share on the chat a um, a link to um, a lesson in the the academy in the NRF Connect SDK fundamentals course that that covers that. So I'll share that right now. It should be coming. There we go. Okay. Then a um, couple of questions about NPM thirteen hundred. I, th I think at least one of them was uh, answered in, in Robin's demo. So on NPM thirteen hundred. Uh, can the button connected to ship hold be used to force the system reset? So I think the answer is yes. Uh, so you can hold it for, if you do long press, uh, it will it will reset the system. Um, I will put a link to the um, part of the product specification uh, that discusses that just as a reference. And then another question, um, is the button in 1300 can act as a PC power switch? So I guess this means turning on and off. Um, I'm not sure if this is possible. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to do here is sort of disconnect the whole system from power and reconnect it. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, to be honest, but um, I'll just put a link to the product specification um, to the you know the, the top level of the, of the product spec for this device. And if you can't find the answer, then, then I, my recommendation is that you ask on, on DevZone and they'll try to, to help you with this or trying to implement the functionality that, that you need. And then one question about DECT NR, uh, NR plus support and samples. Um, so currently we don't have DECT NR plus support in the SDK. Um, we do have the, the Phi layer. So in the NRF 9161, 9151, and 9131, they, all of those three devices have uh, DECT, NR, uh, DECT NR plus support. Not the NRF 9160, which is a device that's been you know out in the field for about five or six years, but the newer ones do have it. Um, but you need to make a choice. So the modem firmware that you flash to the device, it's either the cellular IoT modem firmware, so supporting NMDI IoT um, or an LTM, or it is the DECNR Plus modem firmware that gives you access to the Phi. Um, and then if you want the full stack solution, you would need to, at least for now, work with one of our partners. For example, Wirepass in Finland has, has a full DECTR Plus stack. Uh, but my recommendation here is that you reach out to our sales. You can find the contact link in our webpage. 
because even uh, getting access to the Dexter Plus uh, firmware uh, requires, you know, going through sales. It's still not, let's say, generally available to, to every customer. Uh, okay, a couple more questions came. Let me see here. No, the thing is not recognized. Okay, thanks for confirming that. Uh, then it was my mistake. But uh, I'm, I'm guessing that, like I mentioned earlier, that if NRF util is not a backend, it should come at some point. I just don't quite know when. Uh, the generic GPO and the Academy peers still be using the GPO LEDs. Oh, that might be the case. Uh, I didn't check that very thoroughly. Um, maybe the new course covers that in more detail. All right. Uh, let me see if there are any more questions. I guess that's all for questions. So thanks everyone for um, attending the webinar today and uh, wish you a rest of a nice uh, morning, evening, uh, wherever you may be. And um, looking forward to have you back on one of our next webinars. So have a good day.